Let me tell you a story. In a galaxy far, far away. Nah, I'm just kidding. But seriously, about five years ago, on a space station not so far away, a trio of cube-shaped robots set out on a multi-year mission. The mission was to help pave the way for future robots and autonomous systems in space. Now, much like the droids of Star Wars' universe, NASA's free-flying robotic system called Astrobe, it was designed to be a helpful robot on the ISS. It would assist astronauts with uh, specific tasks, test out new technologies in ways that were simply not possible here on Earth. And after all, robotic helpers are going to be an integral part of a space exploration as we move forward, exciting years ahead. So it's time to learn a bit more about this small swarm of free flying robots buzzing around on the International Space Station. With me on Over the Horizon for this very special episode is Roberto Cardeno. He's a software and hardware test engineer for the Astrobe program at NASA. Welcome, Roberto. Also with us is Dr. Scott Walter. He's a mechanical and aerospace engineer and a robotics expert, our go-to robotics guru. Ben Inoue, who's a power systems engineer at NASA JPL. And of course, Ozan Bellick, who's a self-professed uh, space nerd and a software developer. Welcome, gentlemen. It's great to have you on Over the Horizon. Great to be here. Thank you. Here. Always great, Jordan. All right, so let's let's start off with uh, the the development of Astro B. Uh, Roberto, tell us a bit about the program. Uh, you've been with it for what about six, seven years now. What's your experience been like? Very high level understanding, and give us a bit of a, a sense of you know the the path to the de development of these of these bots. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been on the Astro B project now for more than ten years. I started right around when we were doing integration assembly, integration and testing at NASA Ames. Um, and then uh, for now five years or more, we've been operating the robots on the ISS. So uh, we've done a lot of you know work operations with the, with the robots in these five, last five years, tested uh, all kinds of different technologies, uh, new experiments, new uh, guest scientists, uh, payloads or experiments. And uh, yeah, we've been basically uh, doing uh, lots of uh, uh, all night sessions uh, <laughs> operating the robots uh, during the ISS. So uh, yeah, it's been it's been a, you know, a long journey, but really really amazing what we've been able to do. Yeah. Um, and these are the spheres that we're seeing on our screens now. So this was the first iteration, right? Astrobeus, it was the follow up, correct? Absolutely, yeah. And actually, it's funny that you mentioned at the beginning that. Um, the idea of these kind of robots was from, uh, you know, the Star Wars little droid robots, uh, because spheres, in a sense, actually was kind of inspired by the little spherical uh, Jedi droid, the training robot. Um, and so that was the first idea of using a, a kind of like a little free flying robot inside the space station to do experiments uh and then we also use it a lot as a educational platform to do uh student competitions uh, with the zero robotics competition um and spheres was very 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 um much oriented to this but was very limited by a lot of the components and parts of the of the robots themselves and also of the the conditions in which it was uh, operating uh, and Astro B was basically after Spheres was actually one of the most used payloads on the ISS was used for 13 years and yeah, performed a lot of experiments. Uh, but then after, you know, so long, everything needs, you know, a new version or a kind of upgrade. And so, uh, that's why we built, uh, Astro B and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was kind of like the new generation of free flying robots. So all kind of uh, amazing new upgrades um, and also functionalities and um, uh, objectives in a sense. So, so yeah, Astro B yeah. is uh, you know the new generation of free flying robots. Yeah, and how much was a, of a of a design evolution challenge was it to go from spheres to Astro B and and what how much of a leap was it really in terms of technology? Yeah, it's. Uh, like you know, many other space projects, it's usually 
something between you know, three to five years from the moment of concept until the moment of launch. And uh, yeah, so the first us three robots were launched to the ISS around uh, uh, late 2018 uh, or 2019. So we had we started doing actual operations with robots around 2019, and the project uh, kind of like started around what was it like 2014, 2015? Uh, the time mm -hmm. kind of like started the design, the concept. So so yeah, it's usual the usual three to five years, uh, which is not too bad. But you know, for space projects, that's the expectation. Yeah, and Scott, I mean, you're you're our go-to guru for uh, all things robotics. Uh, it's it's quite. I mean, we we keep talking about humanoid bots and AI-enabled humanoid bots on here, Earth, but this is a a different use case. And of course, Ben, we've seen rovers on on Mars, which are robots essentially. Yeah, Scott, uh, yeah. when we talk about uh, robots on on Earth, we call them manipulators. So the whole idea is they're trying to manipulate something from one location to another. And because we're in a gravitational field, we take one particular approach, uh, which is usually to bolt it down because we're constantly having to fight gravity. And so this case is very different. Uh, you're, the idea is to manipulate, to move from one location to space or somewhere else. But in order to actually do something, you need some sort of end of arm tooling. So an industrial robot can't do anything unless it's got a tool attached to it. And I can see that Astro B has some sort of gripper manipulator to be able to grab and move things around. And I wonder is, does it have other tooling built in for it, into it to do something besides just grabbing, manipulating? And of course, the other thing we're gonna wanna talk about is how it actually is able to move about. Uh, yeah. And I've, I've got a lot of uh, interesting questions like, mm -hmm. about that, but you know, the first thing is like, what is it attempting to do? What What is the package that's attached to it? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the main kind of use of, well, Astro is basically, um, we, we call it multi-use platform. A scientific platform because it's a, a the main uh, uh, objective uh, use is to be a, a guest science platform for anyone to develop an experiment or a payload and then launch it to the ISS, attach it on the robot, plug and play, and then perform the experiment in the microgravity mm -hmm. environment of the ISS. And so you can imagine, uh, you just basically need for uh, that kind of experiment or payload, you just need basically power and being able to move free fly in the space station. So that's what Astro provides. So, and you can have all kind of a huge variety of experiments, which we've been having in the last five years. Um, and so, so yeah, we've been having, uh, uh, you know, experiments for new sensors inside the, for, for the space station, uh, new algorithms to do uh, kind of uh, uh, navigation, uh, camera based navigations, um, or uh, new hardware experiments with new materials, to be tested inside the space station. So in general, it's a, in a, a way to help advance what it's called the TRL, the technology readiness level for space. So from low level, from like five or so, something up to you know nine, which is the, the level that you'd reach when you test your experiment in space. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that was the, one of the main use purposes of the robots. And then we've been using them also for all kinds of other stuff. Educational purposes, we started doing amazing student competitions. We have two big main uh, student competitions. One throughout the entire Asia uh, with like uh, 13, 14 different countries in Asia. There is, uh, it's managed by the Japanese space agency JAXA. And so, but there is, uh, uh, you know, all kind of uh, uh, Thailand uh, and uh, uh, Japan and uh, uh, Middle East, all kind of the different countries that use the robots for this kind of like little competition. Uh, for students. And then we have the other one, the other side in the US with Zero Robotics managed by MIT uh, to engage students in the US and also I think in Europe. Um, so these are the big main uses of the robots. And I think you asked also, how do they move, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and, and on an Earth, like I say, it's uh, usually you always complain about how gravity makes everything difficult because you got to fight the payload and everything else. And then when you go to design something without gravity, you realize that, man, gravity makes everything a whole lot easier, doesn't it? <laughs> because at least you get a direction yep. that's down, something to push against. And so you've got two main ways to move things around. So on Earth, we bolt down an arm onto a wall or floor or ceiling, and we can just move everything around, but that limits your work envelope and it gets in the way of stuff. The other is that you will have some sort of vehicle that's able to move around. And of course, on Earth, we think of it as being more or less on a 2D surface with wheels that are going around. But now you get something really different. It's like 
No, you, you don't want to bolt an arm in there. You don't want to take up a whole lot of room. Uh, and you have the advantage you can actually make something that's a pretty small package compared to what you would normally have. But again, you now really can move in 3D and you can do it without gravity. So I assume you're using some sort of propulsion, some sort of nozzles to do that. You're probably also using some sort of gyroscopes to also provide to either reorient or in many cases to maintain orientation because I, I have a feeling that you know, keeping that thing stable is a lot trickier than most people would think because once you remove gravity things suddenly get harder not necessarily easier yeah you're absolutely right scott so there is uh kind of like a, a useful component of gravity kind of it's a good reference point for navigating uh you know in general autonomously uh so yeah without that on the space station think some things uh get complicated in terms of navigation um but the way we navigate um in space is actually not too di different from what autonomous cars do now uh just using bare um uh, imaging uh camera navigation mm -hmm. so we use exactly this is the navcam uh perfect timing it's a, it's a, a kind of like a smartphone uh rgb camera and we use that just to uh, uh identify so kind of features on the walls of the iss and those features are basically the reference points to create a map uh in the uh in the brain of the of the robot and that map will be kind of compared to the to the images that that navcam takes uh every time and so that provides basically the localization for the robot and then for to navigate to actually move around in in the iss we use uh, kind of like uh, kind of fans, uh, electric fans. Mm -hmm. It's they're called impeller motors. So the side, the two big kind of uh, bulky uh, modules that you see on the side of the robot. Those are impeller motors that spin, and then there's like a little grate uh, on the on the side that uh, let air go inside that module, and so those become pressurized chambers with air, and uh, and so that pressurized chamber. Uh, when it's uh, when you open some of those kind of nozzles or opening uh, uh, around the, the robot, that will um, basically allow the robot to move and rotate in any direction in all uh, six degree of freedom. And uh, so that's that's basically how the robot moves around the axis. Now, do, you, do you have counter rotating impellers? Because I imagine because you're in zero G, like oh, we turn on the fan to blow something out to make it go this way, and as you do it, suddenly the whole thing starts rotating in the counter. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you must have to have yeah. two pairs. And the other yeah. thing I wonder is, do you have an IMU in there at all? Or you're just using do, yes. a visual reference? Ah, you do. Because that's going to be interesting because my, my only zero G experience, uh, experience was uh, a couple of months ago and I took the Apple Vision Pro up there, hoping it oh, would wow. work when you went into zero G. And as soon as you went into zero G, the IMU just got completely messed up. It had no idea where it was. And it didn't have very good references because it looked like a dojo in there, which is like with all the Tommy math. And so it completely lost its frame of reference. So you, you would have the same problem, I imagine. It's like, without gravity, how well does that IMU work? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it, with the IMU, you have, you know, this very nice, you know, uh, strong reference point, which is the, uh, the acceleration of gravity towards one direction. So you can always reference to that uh, to know where you are with the IMU. In space, it's much more complicated. And so. Initially, we were actually using IMU kind of like uh, some of the IMU data fused uh, with the navigation camera images to provide localization. But then we realized that actually the errors accumulated and like uh, there were other ways to make localization more robust. And so we now rely mostly just on the images of the camera. So navigation, it's uh, mostly just pure um, uh, camera uh, navigation. Okay. And so do you have to make sure that there are really strong references in each room that if you get rooms that start to look the same or like if, if the walls have a repeating pattern, does it get lost? Yes and no. Uh, the One of the biggest challenges actually uh, for us was to uh, kind of deal with all the very, very dynamic and changing environment of the ISS because as you can imagine, there are a lot of uh, tenants up there that uh, move things and uh, install new experiments, new payloads. There's like new laptops in different uh, modules. There's new cables all the time installed around, and that changes the yeah. 
the uh, orientation and the the position of all those reference points. And so one of the big challenges that we faced, especially at the beginning, uh, was to to deal with the, that change, that environment. Also the lighting environment, they have all kinds of different lighting settings in different rooms. So one of the things that we need to do is uh, make sure that the lighting set, at least the lighting setting is the same uh, that we that we know, uh, that is used to provide uh, uh, navigation uh, localization for the robot. And then uh, to face the, the challenge of the environment changing, we have to kind of update uh, our map, our reference map on the robot every few months. So just uh, every time go in the different modules and take pictures and uh, update those pictures into our map that is uh, uploaded on the robot. Now, are you using any fiducial reference uh, points like uh, April codes or something like that? Because it looked like you had what most people notice it's kind of a QR code, which is a type of April code that you can stick around different places that could be used for uh, locating things, but also to identify that, oh, over here, expect something is in this drawer. <laughs> it's, so yeah, it doesn't necessarily absolutely. have to read it. So that, that would be one way. And the other thing is, I wonder, now, how sensitive is that if you're trying to stay fixed in space? And I'm assuming, do you have gyroscopes in there or are the fans themselves enough to act as a gyroscope? If you're really trying to stay in one location, as it's orbiting around, are you finding you're constantly having to do something to make that adjustment for it, even though you're in kind of a microgravity? And the other is, how subject is it to like the slightest draft? So if someone is moving through, even though they're nearby, you know, there's probably constant circulation going on. So is it constantly fighting all those forces to stay localized like a drone would? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we... Uh... We are pretty much stable just using the, the impeller motors. So our propulsion uh, system is pretty, you know, robust and uh, and uh, good to face any disturbances. But we ended up uh, f um, uh, figuring out that there is a kind of a, a, all kind of like different uh, air flows inside the ISS uh, from like vents or like astronauts moving or like experiments running. So. There's all kind of you know flows of air in different parts of the of the modules, and so uh, sometimes those affect our operations. Uh, we just need to like reset the position of the robot sometimes and make sure that uh, we are in the initial point where we wanted to, and uh, and that's kind of like the way we um, face all those uh, those issues. And, and um, how about your own cooling fans? So so do you have to actually run fans to cool Astro B? In which case, that's going to cause its own complication, isn't it? Yeah, we, we do have like a, a, a little small uh, cooling fan inside um, the front part. So the, the, the central core, the central part of the robot, so you see on the two sides is the impeller, the propulsion modules. In the middle is this kind of core module that's where we all have, we, we have all the stack of electronics and the sensors. And so inside that, we do have like a small cooling fan for all the electronics. But that is like very, very tiny, so it doesn't really affect much the movement of the of the robot. Does it vent outside or is it just circulating? Uh, there's a little opening also in the back, so it vents a little okay. bit outside as well, yeah. Okay, so you have to compensate for that, yeah. What's mm -hmm. the power draw of the electronics on board? Um, I would say like no more than like a few amps, maybe like, uh, I would say like, Three to five amps maximum total. Uh, um, at what voltage? Uh, I think it's like what is it? Sixteen. The batteries provide sixteen volts. So we have uh, four sixteen volt batteries. Cool. Yeah. And so, so does that the, the two two to five amps? Does that include uh, the uh, payloads that, that you attach to it, or is that just the uh, 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 navigation propulsion? Uh, and um yeah if the payload you can also draw up to i think a few amps as well so the five amps i think it's the maximum total uh, oh. that it's can be drawn yeah but yeah, usually normally nominally it's uh it's uh just like one or two amps that we that we need got it thanks yeah roberto i'd, I'd read that um you guys are using the nvidia tegra k1 processor on there um and, you know i was just wondering how it you know, for the, the Mars helicopters are using the Qualcomm Snapdragon on the Voxel 2 boards, it seems like the applications are somewhat similar, um, you know, vision processing and uh, navigation, etc. I was wondering how you guys arrived at the NVIDIA Tegra. 
Um, I'm not sure where you found this information. I don't think we're, we're using any NVIDIA. We we no. use the uh, we have three main processors: uh, okay. low level, mid level, and high level. They're all uh, kind of like um, Linux based. So two two processors are the Inforce sixty six one, I think, uh, okay. which runs Linux, and then mm -hmm. another one is the Snapdragon, I think, which runs uh, Android. So oh, I don't okay. think uh, maybe so, do you found something about uh, uh, one of the experiments or payloads that was using it that. Could be. Yeah, it, it could have been. But I mean, this, the Snapdragon is kind of what I would have expected. That's what they have on the um, the Voxel 2, you know, which is made by Modal AI. Um, but yeah, that's the COTS part that we're, <coughs> excuse me. But we're using it, the helicopters from Mars. So it, it seemed like an, a, another good application uh, for that for that platform. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and you're a developer on that platform as well, right? Or are you just doing INT work? I did a little bit of everything, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I I worked a lot in the in the hardware side of things, so integrating mm -hmm. and testing, and building the robot. So, uh, but then I did also some uh, development, software development. Uh, also, yeah. Have you guys done a lot of radiation qualification or any radiation qualification on the components for it, or what? You know, are you exposing them to high levels there in the ISS? Yeah, I don't think we had to do any specific uh, uh, radiation testing because it's uh, mm -hmm. it's always inside. It's just like oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you have the design to work levels, basically. Yep, that's right. Yeah. So uh, it's always supposed to work uh, inside uh, the same environment that the oh, no. did, So yeah, for the moment. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. for <laughs> yeah so no in terms of radiation no we didn't have to to do many uh i don't think any any specific tests uh we had to do all kind of other tests like acoustic sure. tests uh emi interference electronic interference mm -hmm. um and then like actually some other fu funny experiments we had to may uh you know prove that in those little grates that you see on the on the side of the robots that uh some astronauts have long hair, um, and that you know, in case the hair <laughs> of the astronauts get caught in the in the impeller motors, mm -hmm. you the robot stops and you can pull the air. So we had to do we had to do that uh, that funny test as well. How, how did yeah, you, you prove see that? that? Yeah. <laughs> uh well, just like we had like oh. a, that's a good question yes <laughs> we are we asked someone with the long hair to no just stand it. <laughs> <laughs> we just we just use a wig <laughs> So yeah, I, I guess just in general testing it. Um, how, how do you, you know, how are you testing your your multi axis of motion here on Earth before you get up on it? You have a very <laughs> yeah. uh, complicated offload system uh, that would allow spins and things like that. Well, funny enough, um, we have we have used the mostly just one specific uh, test facility. It's uh, we call it Granite Lab. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically a huge granite table. And then we have our ground units uh, just placed on some kind of air bearings. So we use some, uh, com here we go, you see that. We have uh, compressed mm -hmm. CO2 tanks that uh, are used to make the robots float. And so although that can only simulate three degrees of freedom, right? Two in, uh, in uh, translation mm -hmm. and one in rotation, it still was always pretty much enough to sure. uh, to just represent and uh, and test the conditions on, on the I guess, I guess so you could always just turn it sideways, right? And then test the other axes. So you just do them one at a time, basically. Exactly. That's what we do. Yeah. Sometimes uh, some uh, some experiments, some payloads need uh, the opposite side of the of the robot. So we just like yeah, rotate it, flip it, flip it ninety degrees. Did you take it on a zero G flight? Um, no, I I don't think we did that. Uh, we did that with spheres uh, a few times, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately I missed it. But okay. uh, we didn't have to do that for us, should be as far as I know. Okay. Um, and, and, and and when you finally deployed it, was there any surprises? I mean, because you, obviously you're thinking the whole thing through. You're modeling this thing. You it's like we're pretty sure we got this down. You do that testing, and you go up there. There must have been a surprise or two. And how were you able to, uh, I guess you know fix those particular problems as you saw them was there a simple software fix or is there something else you had to do yeah uh fortunately most of the issues we had were uh, kind of like software uh, you know uh, able to to fix it by with software um 
but sometimes we had some uh, anomalies or failures. Uh, one, actually, the most common point of failure actually ended up being the SD cards, the memory SD cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just like got corrupted many times, multiple times. We, we still don't know exactly the, the exact reason. We, we think it's um, uh, uh, related to like radiation probably. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so we had to just replace SD cards. Uh, sometimes I, I don't suppose you want to name the brand. <laughs> Stay away from the brand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's give could, it. Could it be like a now, static but... electricity problem or something like that with, with the fans running in what might be a rather dry environment? I don't think so because, uh, we actually had the same SD card on the docking station which is the, the, the station where the Astro B docks and recharges. Yeah, you can see it here on the left mm -hmm. uh, and provides high speed uh, communication. And uh, we had that SD card failing twice also on the dock station. Um, and so, yeah, now we just upgraded. We are upgrading uh, uh, the, uh, those SD cards with the uh, uh, better kind of like high uh, grade, industrial grade, uh, more robust SD cards, uh, which uh, so far, so good. We haven't had any issues, but uh, so we hope that the issue was just uh, the SD card that was not uh, good enough. Um, and um, so, yeah, that was the thing. So for, for the SD cards uh, on our docking station, uh, in theory, everything, uh, the docking station, and also the Astro robots were designed since the very beginning, were designed to be modular and uh, able to be repaired uh, in, in the ISS with by the astronauts. Um, and so, but then at some point we had to, there's always this kind of trade-off between, uh, can the astronaut actually, how much time does the astronaut need to repair the, the robots, uh, work on the procedures, the safety and so on, rather than down mass, bring the robot back to earth in our labs and do the repair ourselves. And so for some things there were, it was easier for the astronaut to repair, like the issue we had, uh, on the, on the dock station for the SD cards. It was pretty easy. You had to just unscrew a little panel and just plug, uh, you know, click the SD card, replace it. And so we asked, uh, we had the, the, the crew uh, to, to, to do the repair. For other issues, uh, especially inside for the robot, uh, the SD card inside the robot, uh, we, we just prefer to bring the robot down and uh, do the repair ourselves. So okay. that's what happened with Honey, the Astro B named Honey, right? Yep, that's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, so help us understand. So this is, are you talking about mostly over the air software updates, correct? But, and, yeah. and a lot of the maintenance that can be done uh, on the ISS itself, except for, so what, what did happen with Honey? Can you give us any insight into what required it to be brought down, prepared and then sent back up? Yeah, it was, uh, we were just like connecting to, to the robot during uh, the beginning of our kind of operations, uh, commanding time. And then mm -hmm. uh, one of the processors, so we have the three processors, one of the, the processors just didn't respond, didn't respond. So it was unresponsive to our, uh, you know, connection, SSH and whatsoever. And then we figure out that something was wrong with the, with the data that we couldn't access the, the, the processor. And, uh, and so we tried to repair it, uh, you know, doing some kind of, um, uh, kind of repair uh, software with their software. But that didn't work, uh, and so we brought it down, and then uh, we just opened it up. We checked the SD card, and uh, sure enough, the issue was there. The kind of similar issue. It was basically a data corruption issue on the SD card, memory corruption, and so so we just basically replaced the SD card, and everything else was fine. So, cool. and then um, cool. so that I think I think this issue on Honey, uh, we had the issue on Honey, another issue also on Queen, the other one. Bumble is mm -hmm. the, the the strongest one. Is the most used Astro B, but never had issues. We don't know why. It's incredible. <laughs> so it's the one that is like uh, holding very strong uh, and uh, working great since the very beginning. But we had an issue with Honey and one with Queen, and there was both the SD cards. And so, but now we replaced the old SD cards with these uh, more robust SD cards. And are all three Astro Bs uh, right now functioning on the ISS? Or uh, no, we have honey? two. Two are on the access to functioning, uh, Bumble and the Honey, and Queen is mm -hmm. down on, in our labs. So we're doing now the repair for Queen. Okay. So, Scott, you know, as I was listening to Roberto talk about how Astro moves, and it, it mm -hmm. kind of reminds me of the whole debate back here on Earth 
uh, when it comes to you know self-driving cars and to whether you need lidar of you know versus just a pure vision model and i can't help but you know want to know your thoughts do you think uh, you know scott and roberts so this is for both of you do you think vision pure vision uh, for locomotion is is the future even you know with uh, something like astrobe and other iterations thereon um i i would think that you you're probably using a similar approach that they use down here on earth for uh, mobile industrial robots you know using something like slam to do the navigation using uh, lidar as references it it's probably not a bad choice in a fixed environment like that Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, vision is because the world is very different and it's, it's constantly changing. It's very difficult to get a map for that environment. Uh, within the, the International Space Station, your speeds are a lot slower, your precision requirements are a little bit different, and you build these maps and that allows you to be able to navigate with a lot more precision. So probably using LiDAR in that situation is perfectly fine. You probably could attempt to also do it with vision at some point. But there was one question I, I had regarding the navigations. I noticed in a couple of the um, of the animations we saw there that the cube is literally able to turn on a dime. It just completely rotated itself around. And is that being done using the nozzles or was that actually being done using uh, gyroscopes? It's all by the nozzles, yeah. Just by the propeller. Wow, uh, because that, that, I mean, that was just unbelievable. I'm looking at it and I said, oh no, that, that, that's good. that looks like a gyroscopic kind of reorientation because it was just so precise. Yeah, yeah, that's the fun thing is that when you pressurize air in these propulsion modules, then you just need to open the nozzles opposite mm -hmm. side just slightly and you get like a really, really you know, nice uh, moment. Yeah, but you got to do it right. I mean, it's going to be perfectly balanced. It's like one of them just oh, off yeah. a little bit and you've got like no gravity, no friction. You can just imagine it kind of sliding off somewhere else. And I was just looking and said, like, wow, that, but then at the same time, imagine you don't need very much, right? It's just like the slightest little yep. puff and that's all it takes to get, make the move around. So the only thing you're yeah, fighting is exactly. inertia. You're really not fighting um, a weight or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so right. when that when the payloads come on board, you know that changes your center of mass. How does that? <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit, a bit about the strategy for dealing with that for uh, propulsion? Yeah, that's a really good question. So some payloads are like the standard kind of size volume and weight so we we actually have like a kind of limit usually on the, the the weight of the payload so for all those payloads that are like within the usual requirements uh we account that already that change in the inertia and, and the all kind of uh uh things like that um but then like sometimes we have uh unusual uh, kind of like different payloads and so we have to re kind of assess that momentum or inertia um, okay, but that does definitely uh, it's not uh, self learning where it's just like, oh, okay, that uh, that moved me laterally when I was just trying to do a rotation. So, so now I know my center of mass has shifted a little this way and I'll adjust accordingly. It is, it is, it's, it's not quite, it's not doing that on its own. No, okay. no, that's right. We gotta, we gotta do that. Yeah. In okay. our labs, yeah, we usually do that down on in our labs first. So, so you know a priori what the the mass is of the object you're attempting to get, or have a reasonably good guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The mass and of it, uh, and, and is that comes from, mass, from experiment and measurement, or like when you go to pick something up, like if I'm going to go pick up this bottle, I know it's got a, a certain mass, and I can I can calculate it ahead of time of what it's going to be, so I know when I grab it that combined together, this is my new center of gravity and moments of inertia. And is that something that's done experimentally on Earth ahead of time with some of these objects, or is it something that just comes from CAD data? Because so, the problem with this bottle is that is it had one mass at the beginning of this program. It's got a different one now. Okay, so so uh, along with that, uh, I was, my understanding was that the uh, the the hand was used to uh, hold hold on to fixtures so that uh, the robot is fixed in one place and not to manipulate objects and carry them around. Is that is that right? Yeah, you are totally right. So you are 90% right, Ozan, because uh, we use that gripping uh, perching arm or gripper mostly just to attach onto the handrails. And like in the initial idea was to have, you know, the robot just uh, attached there and uh, basically just stay there uh, stably without using the impeller motors, the propulsion. Uh, so you could do extended operations for many more hours because the most uh, of the power is used by the, the, the propulsion, right? 
but but then a few other um, groups uh, uh, ended up using the, the perching arm to do some uh, uh, new experiments, moving and touching onto some uh, specific uh, uh, objects and uh, move them around and uh, and do some uh, experiments actually uh, to see like uh, how the robot uh, can reassess the moment the the, ner- the inertia based on the ro- on the on the object that it touches to. Um, so we've done a little bit of both. Okay. So then to yeah. Scott's uh, question, then those those experiments do do they need to uh, adjust the, the the propulsion logic ahead of time, or it was the experiment itself? Like, can can we adjust in real time? Um, so, I mean, I give you an example of the because this is really cool, actually, to tell you. Um, one of the experiments that uh, was done using Astrobe, uh was from a group from uh, the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and what they did it's called Astrobody. My neighborhood. They yeah, they're, 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 they're neighbors. So they basically wanted to demonstrate that um, they could uh, do some uh, propellantless uh, motion uh, in, in using just the perching arm, like swinging from these handrails, kind of like monkeys in space. Um, and so they basically uh, were like swinging from the handrail and proving that the the, the kind of motion, the trajectory uh, could be used to move in, in space without the use or with a reduced use of the impeller motors. Um, and so that was like one of the things uh, that uh, we tested that we, we used us to report. Nice. Yeah, monkeys yeah. in space, what next? <laughs> that was really cool, actually. Yeah. <laughs> one arm monkeys in space. One arm monkeys in space. <laughs> I, I am yeah. curious about well, what is next. So, you know, this concept, it seems like it's a, uh, you want to move TRL up. Um, you want to prove the usefulness of these robots. Um, what's the next step for this type of platform? Yeah, I mean, um, so, you know, Hopefully, we can uh, still operate for the next few years until ISS uh, gets decommissioned. Um, so right now, the idea is to just uh, continue to use the Astrobe to uh, test new type of experiments in space, new payloads in space. Uh, there is an, a group that is proposing to uh, just have a more uh, advanced um, kind of uh, uh, computing capabilities in their payload that Astrobe could use. Uh, because the problem with Astrobe is that, you know, most of the electronics are very old. Uh, you know, mm. in space, you got to use things that have been, you know, tested, verified, and validated years in advance. So our yeah. electronics uh, are very old and uh, cannot do real-time slam, for example. That's why we actually yeah, have... At, the... least you, at least you don't have a RAD 750 on there. <laughs> I guess that's uh, yeah, that's lucky. That's You're it. winning there. So yeah. Anyway, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but still, so that's the issue. Like we would, for example, like we cannot do real time slam for the entire inside entire uh, ISS modules because we don't have the uh, computing uh, capabilities for that. And so uh, some some ideas are to just uh, have a payload uh, to attach onto Astro B and have like more advanced uh, electronics that could be used to do real slam. And so there's all kind of upgrades that we could do. We're not planning to do like specific hardware upgrades on the robots themselves, but there's a few ideas of like having some enhanced uh, or more advanced uh, uh, hardware attached onto the robot as a payload and then use that to uh, improve the capabilities. Um, and then, yeah, just continue, just do all uh, what we've done so far. Just uh, uh, allow all different people, different groups to to test their experiments in, uh, in on the assets, which is, for, for us, it's actually like uh, a really good turnaround. Like usually to send something in space and test it and advance the, le- the TRL level takes usually years and years. Yeah. For Astrobe, yeah. uh, we had uh, groups that could launch in like a year and a half, two years. Uh, so mm. sometimes you can literally prove your uh, technology in space and the ISS in just a couple of years, which is yeah, pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. So nice thing about fact, having people available there, you know, to support uh, deployment. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and speaking of uh, people deployed there, um, can you maybe give us a sense of um, 
of, of the capabilities of Astro B and how does it enhance astronaut efficiency of the ISS? I mean, maybe give us an idea of some of the most complex tasks that Astro B has been able to perform either autonomously or, uh, you know, along with or assist an astronaut. Um, let's see, we, we proposed a few things. Uh, um, unfortunately, it was really hard to, uh, to change the, uh, the kind of the protocol or the, the usual uh, way of doing things on the ISS. So uh, we've used Astrobe to also demonstrate that we can uh, uh, use them to do monitoring or inspections of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we actually were doing is to, with our cameras, just take uh, you know very close up uh, uh, pictures and videos of like some of the seals of the hatches, um, and that's one of the things that the astronauts do. They need to go with the, their camera around manually and check that there is no uh, no issues or or yeah. uh, um, or problems. Uh, so that's so, one of the things. So typical inspection work, really. Yeah, inspection work. Yeah, and then uh, another uh, another really cool payload experiment that we uh, used for with Astrobe was uh, from a group at JSC. It's called Realm. Uh, it's an RFID tag reader, mm -hmm. um, and so on, on the ISS, a lot of uh, objects get get lost very easily, as you can imagine. Like because you just turn around and everything is gone, <laughs> um, and so. Uh, they are basically trying to stick these kind of like RFID tags on uh, all of the objects on the ISS. And then we have, uh, with Astrobe, we were able to, to demonstrate, it was called uh, uh, Realm 2, I think. The, they were going around the ISS with Astrobe and just uh, identify and locate thousands of these uh, tags <laughs> and objects. And so like that's air also... Air tags, basically. Air tags, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, kind of like air tags, yeah. But it's, it's very, very easy. They're just like a printed uh, a tag. So it's oh, just like cool. a barcode printed, yeah. and you can with an with an antenna you can uh, radiate, and uh, and then the receiving mm -hmm. um, signal back tells you where the object is, which object, and so on. And it's amazing. So you can locate literally thousands of objects very accurately in different locations and do yeah, inventory. Uh, and so that's another thing that we demonstrated with Astrobe, with the help of Astrobe, the payload uh, uh, from JSC Johnson Space Center in Houston uh, did that. So so yeah, there's all kind of stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm curious to know it you know in in these interactions with the astronauts on board are there any design iterations that you've made that have been derived from the feedback uh, that you've received from astronauts or, or actually actual tasks that have been carried out on on the ISS? Um, yeah, one of the main tasks that we wanted to do with Astrobe was about the the spot inspections, um, and then honestly, like uh, we just uh, we just were just really busy working mostly on on the payloads on the experiments from our uh, payload developers. Um, we were talking about uh, having Astro B, you know, kind of like uh, while the astronaut does the experiment. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have like kind of like a portable camera recording uh, the experiment from different angles. So that's also something that we propose and we are working on. Um, and uh, so that's something that we could uh, use as really like a kind of like a space drone, right? You just fly around and take different close-up videos and pictures. Um, but most of the work that we've been doing with Astrobe are it's mainly for the experiments for the, uh, the the payload developers, and then the other big thing is the student competitions. Right, right, and of course the guest scientist um, projects, right? The guest scientist program. Yeah. Exactly. Which I, I believe has seen some really uh, substantial projects uh, come to fruition. Oh, yeah. Incredible, uh, incredible results and success. So some of the uh, results, uh, there was one big uh, project called uh, SoundSea. With, it was a, a, um, a collaboration between uh, uh, Bosch and Astrobotic. And they, were, uh, they had uh, uh, an array of ultrasonic microphones. Uh, kind of what they do in the uh, assembly lines for cars. They have this kind of uh, very uh, specific uh, microphones that listen uh, to the sound emitted by the machines, and they can predict when some machines uh, uh, fail or are uh, you know getting to fail. And so they they did the same inside the ISS. They uh, were uh, taking uh, measurements of sound from some machines inside the ISS. And they were able to correlate that with the uh, the function or the uh, the 
kind of uh, uh, functionality of that machine. Um, mm. So yeah, all kinds of things like that. And then uh, materials that were tested in space from oh, there's a, another project, Gecko from Stanford. They were uh, testing some kind of material, adhesive material uh, to grip onto smooth surfaces. There was the res results of that was uh, then uh, applied for some other ideas of doing capturing of uh, uh, orbital debris uh, mitigation uh, projects. Uh, there's yeah a lot of like really cool uh, results from uh, experience yeah. on that. Yeah, it's 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 useful to remember here that the ISS is a big giant lab in the sky, and that yep. we we on Earth we've benefited from so much of the science that's has been carried out uh, on the ISS. And Scott, I'm just thinking this is you know the first example that um, that Roberta just cited would be right in your wheelhouse, right? Um, you're a factory simulation expert, so you see a lot of crossovers in what he said. Oh yeah, so there's a lot of similarities, but at the same time, it's kind of that dream project of, you know, being able to make something in a weightless environment and completely different way of doing propulsion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you'd have it in a, in a physics class as like a homework assignment. You could never imagine you'd actually get a chance to build it. So in some ways, boy, I'm really jealous that Roberto had a chance to work in something like that because it just seems neat trying to solve those kinds of problems that you would have. I also noticed that you had like uh, coordination between uh, two of the the Astro bees out there. There was a, a very large, look, looked like a almost large luggage that was being moved through the ISS, and you had one in the front and one in the back. So even then, that's that's like an interesting software challenge to get the two to be able to to coordinate the movements together. So, yeah, hats off. That's that's. A, a very interesting uh, design project that you went through, I, I, I would say. And I'm sure you learned quite a bit for, for future designs because this is only the beginning that you're going to see something like this. And then we begin to wonder, it's like, okay, we've, we've got a lot of data on doing this, but it's in actually an atmospheric environment that's weightless. Now, what would be the trick of doing something like this actually out in the vacuum? That, you know, again, small, small thrusters at, at this point, you wouldn't, it'd be hard to rely on compressed air where you're going to get it, but you could potentially do something like that. And I just wonder how useful that would be as a kind of a swarm that might be going on, working on the outside of the International Space Station and then be able to come back in and, and recharge and, and get like a new propellant boost at the same or, time. Or the moon, you know. Or the moon, yeah. Yeah, yeah the moon will be interesting because then you're, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's low gravity, but yeah, again, there you, you potentially could use compressed air just, just, like remember uh, Space 1999, they had those compressed air thrusters for the eagles that were going around. It's always neat. Gentlemen, yeah, I need to sign off. So uh, Roberto, it was great talking to you guys and uh, you know everyone else, always good. So I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> See you, ben. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Yeah, nice uh, to lovely you. having you. Yep. Thanks, Ben. Bye, Ben. Bye. So I want to ask, is there a third generation robot that's in the works or in conception uh there is like some concepts that we've been working on uh, nothing has been uh, you know officially accepted uh or approved so but but yeah we would love to see something like this on the gateway for example lunar gateway imagine mm -hmm. like you know the lunar gateway is going to be inhabited only for like 10 percent here so uh, you know having a, a kind of platform like astro being able to do maintenance and uh, uh kind of inspections around um uh, that will be huge, beneficial, right? Yeah. What are some of the capabilities that you would like to add with the third generation robot? Yeah, the, I think you, you want two hands. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so many things. yeah, yeah, yeah. So for example, like one of the things that could be really useful is being able to actually have like a good manipulator that could mm -hmm. actually, you know, attach and move different experiments. Uh, there are a few projects, I think uh, the Japanese Space Agency or other are working on something like that inside the ISS, kind of like a new uh, demonstration for, for that. Um, but yeah, having a, a, a robot that could uh, uh, just attach uh, onto some experiments and move them in different racks or just uh, move them around in different places of the, of the space station, that could be huge. So, yeah. Would it would it be larger? Are you adding? Like I would say so. Yeah, that's the yeah, that's the thing. Like, um, definitely, if you want to move big things around, uh, you need to be like a bit bigger, probably for stability. 
Um, but but yeah, that's you know then that's the trade off between like being you know maneuverable and uh, agile uh, mm-hmm. uh, rather than like you know being able to t- touch too many things. Yeah, how how big is it currently? Because I know we're seeing a little bit there, but I'm not quite sure whether it's like this big or is it like that big. I'm getting a hard. Can you? It's uh it's a one. A, what is it? Three three feet cube. Um, oh, okay. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. One one, one foot, foot. One foot. Right. One foot. One one foot. foot. So thirty one, centimeters. Thirty centimeters. Okay, thir- yeah, okay, a foot by foot by foot. So, okay. Yeah. Would it, would a larger uh, version with uh, manipulators for moving things around still retain that cube-like form factor? Or would, we, would you go to something that would, I don't know, maybe like a, a, a longer prism that could navigate through small spaces but still have that bulk? That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think like one of the things that worked really well for us the the cube factor even though you know some other uh real li- little robots on the ISS have uh, like you know spherical shape that is like you know looks more cute or uh like you know more smooth and nice uh yeah like spheres or even like the Japanese space agency has another uh, robot called Inball uh which looks pretty cute um I think for being to be a an, um a really easy uh, uh, science platform to integrate all kind of different payloads. Uh, the 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 shape, the cube shape, is definitely like the most useful one. Uh, so in that sense, if we if we imagine a new generation that wants to still focus on the the development and the test of uh, new payloads, I would say the uh, the cube shape uh, would be still preferred probably. And I'm I'm curious. Um, so there's there's so much of talk about the future of robotics in space exploration, correct? Does it need to be, from your experience, Roberto, does it need to be one form factor or can it be multiple form factors, different form factors depending upon the use cases? And Astrobe could very well be one of those form factors moving ahead, maybe a different, uh, a future iteration of it. Um, so you mean if we could have different type of Astrobe with different form factors? Well, there's, you know, we've uh, here on Over the Horizon in the past, we've uh, Scott and Ozan and Ben, and we've talked about, um, you know, the future of, let's say, the Tesla Optimus humanoid robot, um, you know, being used in space. We've also discussed the possibility of, uh, you know, some like a, an Optimus with, with huge arms uh, being deployed on the ISS for extra uh, vehicular activity, you know, for spacewalks and stuff and maintenance. Mm-hmm which would not need human astronauts as much um, to, to put them in danger as much, right? Um, Scott, if you remember those discussions that we've had. So I'm just wondering, you know, does it, uh, is, are we too focused on the humanoid form for robotics moving ahead? And should we not also consider different form factors like astrobe? Um Yeah, I, I would say so. Like there's all kinds of different form factors we should definitely consider. Um, it's it's unfortunate we had um, the uh, what was the name of the humanoid robot on the uh, ISS? Um, uh, Fyodor that was there, the Russian one. No, the the one from the I, from I think it was Valkyrie. Valkyrie. Oh, okay. Valkyrie. No, there was another one. Um, ah. um, Robonaut. Robonaut. Okay. Robonaut okay. Uh, was a, a humanoid robot that was like. From a NASA Johnson Space Center, um, and uh, they they had it on the ISS for a while, and then they even tested it for a little bit, but then they had issues, and so I don't know they brought it back, um, and so unfortunately they didn't uh, didn't last as long <laughs> as we were expecting. So mm-hmm. um, so I would have loved to see some. We actually uh, were hoping to do some interaction between the two, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So. Um, but yeah, I would love to see all kind of different type of robots, yeah. different shapes, and the different form factors that can actually interact and work together. Because yeah, and well, it's gonna NASA happen. is yeah. This is Valkyrie, right? This is NASA's uh, humanoid bot project. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I'm hoping to get someone from the Valkyrie team to join us and for a similar chat on on over the horizon sometime in the future. But I mean, this is a case in point. Um, and of course, technology has evolved a lot since. Um, since uh, the the case with the humanoid bot that you mentioned, um, so there is uh, a, a bright future, I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, 
even like uh, having some kind of uh, um, the little Boston Dynamics uh, robots maybe right. going to the moon, the surf, I'm sure like there is all kind of uh, adaptation that you have to do for that. But like having some kind of uh, robots like those uh, on the moon could be like absolutely beneficial for so many different things. Um, and so, yeah, there's all kind of new robots that we're now, right now, just the releasing on the, uh, you know, on Earth. And so, I'm sure those are gonna definitely influence a lot our ideas for uh, for uh, space exploration. Yeah, I'm just curious to know what sort of, um, you know, when it comes to work, robots working alongside humans um, on the ISS or in space. Um, what sort of qualification requirements would you uh, necessarily need to take into account? For, to to work with the with the astronauts, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. or or to yeah, operate in the same environment. I mean, yeah. just just for for safety and and the operating environment. Yeah, 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 yeah. For safety, yeah. So there's uh, all kind of things that uh, we had to to validate and prove. For example, uh, we have bumpers on all the corners of the robot in case the robot just uh, uh, gets out of control and uh, accelerates no stop. We had mm -hmm. to prove that they would reach, uh, even by reaching their highest uh, velocity, uh, they would not cause any any like uh, you know serious damage to any 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 object. Uh, so yeah, you can see the the bump, the bumpers, and then we have all kind of like also privacy uh, safety issues. So there's uh, all kind of lights that are um, on the front of the robot that show. Uh, that if the the, the robot is uh, recording a video or taking images uh, or if it's recording audio things like that, so there was been a long long list of uh, uh, functionalities that needed to be yeah. um, compliant with the environment on the SS and the astronauts. And, right, and right. what is the maximum speed it can go, and, and what is the normal operational speed? Um, I think. Uh, we have also a kind of like a range finder, kind of like a lidar on top of the of the robot. That if the robot gets to more than like one meter per second, or, or maybe it's ten centimeters per second. Fortunately, we never had to engage it. But in case that happens, the it kills the power to the robot, and so the robot just uh, the stops and because uh, I, uh, I imagine just... it could probably get up pretty quick. It would really just be limited oh, yeah. to whatever the yeah. the G's are. So, so maybe the question mm -hmm. I should be asking is: is what the maximum G's it's providing? Is you know, on Earth, usually like uh, mobile industrial robots, about one point five meters uh, per second is what they they would like, because then you wouldn't get injured. So one meter per second would make sense, but by a factor of ten, I could believe, because <laughs> in space yeah. you want everything to be a little bit slower. So it might be more like uh, yeah, a uh, hundred centimeters. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was the, so I think the requirement was that we would take the entire length of the gem module, which will, which is the main module where we operate, and then uh, have that, uh, you know, speed across uh, the long module and being able to demonstrate that the impact with the bumpers wouldn't cause any any damage. So that was the requirement for the the, the bumpers, for example. And what was so that I think actually that was it like it, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't second? crack they wouldn't crack the windows mm -hmm. because that was like the main uh, concern <laughs> <laughs> if you if you just like by mistake you know just bump into a uh -oh. window <laughs> that wouldn't be mm -hmm. that wouldn't be fun not good and, yes and then again how, how much thrust uh, can they produce from those nozzles I imagine it must be very low yeah it's very low it's a few newtons um, you don't get much uh, much thrust. It's by design how, as well. Yeah. What's what's the mass of the of the bee? Uh, I think it's like something like eight kilos. Uh, okay. So like around yeah, what is it? Thirteen pounds or something? Twelve pounds maybe? You know, Roberto, you have the um, what's known as the integrated system for autonomous uh, and adaptive caretaking, Isaac, uh, for short. How how does Astro B? I mean, tell us a bit more about this project and how does Astro B fit into it? Yeah, yeah. So Isaac was one of the payloads or um, projects, uh, experiments that we were uh, um, uh, using Astrobe with. And uh, the idea was to demonstrate that you can uh, uh, just integrate different uh, uh, data from different sensors um, into like 
uh, kind of like a caretaking uh, uh, management system for for uh, robotics. And so uh, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, results from Isaac was to demonstrate that we can uh, just fly around uh, different modules and uh, just take some uh, uh, high definition uh, images and create panoramic views, kind of like a 3D map, uh, 3D views uh, from Google. Uh, and so we did that in different modules of the ISS. Uh, and uh, another cool thing that we did with Isaac was being able to operate the two robots at the same time in two modules and then have crew, two crew members work in two modules at the same time. So we had literally like four uh, crew members working at the same time, two robotics, two human. Um, and so that was fun. Um, so yeah, there was, uh, and then we also, yeah, we also kind of like integrated some of the results of uh, other experiments or other sensors um, from other, other payloads uh, together. So yeah, that yeah. was one of the big objectives, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, of course, you're also uh, involved with the Solar Sail project, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, yeah. we just launched a couple of months ago. It's uh, it's in orbit right now. Uh, actually, I need to go yeah. soon for that for another meeting. Yeah, but we are operating that, uh, and uh, it, we're gonna deploy the Solar Sail in a few weeks, hopefully. And uh, nice. yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah, I'm hoping to get you back on. If we haven't bent your ears already with all these questions, I'm hoping to get you back on. I hope you've had fun. Uh, you know, it's been yeah, a, it was amazing, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, before we go, Scott, you have to explain to our viewers the significance of that T-shirt you're wearing. What does it mean? No, come uh, on. This, this, yeah, this this was a, a gift from uh, some friends of mine that are, are just as nerdy as I am, and these are the different kinds of functions you may have learned of. <laughs> In uh, high school and middle school math, you know, the uh, linear equation, the x squared or the uh, parabola, the cube, and also throw in some sine functions, some absolute value functions <laughs> and everything else. So you just have to learn how to do it. So if your arm is like, well, I'm mirrored, so everything's a little bit. So this is like x equals y. And I suppose if you have like x equals or y equals 2x, you'd be a little bit steeper, right? Something like that. And, you know, so you can get your different slopes. That's y equals like a constant function there absolute value function you you know your sine wave your cosine wave everything else i think there was even like an arc tangent function in there somewhere so yeah fantastic yeah make that's a cheat sheet. <laughs> oh absolutely all right so listen roberto thank you so much it has been thank such you. a pleasure talking to you thank you guys so, so educative and informative and thank you to scott um, the Ozan and Ben. Let me just pull up before we go. Let me just pull up your uh, social media profile so those watching can reach out to you guys. Uh, this is Roberto on LinkedIn. Um, don't spam him. <laughs> we want him back on Over the Horizon. Please. <laughs> and uh, this is, of course, Scott Walter on X. He's at Golding Ballistic 5. Ben Inoue uh, from NASA JPL, who was with us uh, a few minutes back. He's at Ben Inoue and our very own Ozan Bay. Ozan Belik, uh, he's on X as well. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and especially you, Roberto. It's been such such oh, a yeah, pleasure talking to you. Thank you. It was uh, it was really thank cool, you. guys. Very nice chat. Thanks yeah, so much. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ciao. Hopefully Spread the soon. word. Ciao. Spread the word. We need more guys <laughs> like you from NASA to talk about our <laughs> wonderful project. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good See one. you soon. Yeah.